second. Let's welcome Matt to the show. Matt, what is hey, how's it going? Man? Welcome to the show, bud. How are welcome you? Welcome in, dude. Doing, doing well. Doing, doing well. Awesome. It's a, it's a good morning so far. It's uh, kind of warm, actually, here in Denver. It's the tail end of summer. Should be more fall weather, but I think it's going to be like mid-80s today. So Denver, wow. gorgeous. That is um, yeah. Mid-80s? Jesus. Yeah, dude. Yeah, and I know. I got, I'm kind of ready. Well, that's what – it's really interesting. The mornings are chilly, uh, like – 60s and then throughout the day it just gets progressively warmer yeah. and so yeah. like after like, work today it'll be like low 80s so. right around now in about half an hour to 45 minutes this window is just going to hit so much sun that like you know the temperature in my room is going to go up like five degrees also it's just one of those incorrectly set up work that's quite you know uh, so what is this picture everyone is referencing i don't know if i remember it I Bro, think you had, you, I think you, you it was like your old LinkedIn. Am I remembering? This oh, right? yes. Right now I remember. Right if it's that right. one, it's the one we were roasting me about. Yes. Yes. But from when I was, I think, 20 and I'm 26 now. So yeah. quite a bit more gray hair now. Maybe a little bit wiser, but you know how it works. Crypto, crypto will do that to you, man. We were all completely gray under the covers. Dude. You know, that's why I wear a hat with an axolotl on. So. Oh, yeah. I, I can't believe the amount of gray that appeared uh, at my one-year mark in crypto, man. That was crazy, you know? Working in crypto for one year, I'm like, what? Has it been? Has it only been one year, Jimmy? Really? Say that again? How long has it been? It's, it's been more than one year. Come on. Oh, it's been way over one year. But I'm saying, yeah, exactly. like, that's when the gray started to, to sprout. I was like... Oh man, what's what what's happening to me? You know what I mean. I'm going through changes. You know. <laughs> so oh, Matt, it's let's great to have you back on the show, Matt. dude. Oh, what's what's up, Firestorm? I was just gonna say I'm gonna go straight into it. Do Matt, it, Matt. What is hyperspace, bro? I think it's hot <laughs> off the press. Yeah, so it's a pro style NFT marketplace, meaning because. This is Dexalot show. Most of hopefully the listeners know what an order book is. And so essentially it's going to be bring order book principles to an NFT marketplace. And so there'll be pro tools for trading in which you can graph these NFT order books. Um, mm -hmm. When maybe you TA on them. Wait, I'm not much of a TA a, guy, but is it a marketplace or is it a tooling? Like, is it a tool to look at liquidity and markets and all that? Or is it a marketplace itself? So it's a marketplace itself, but it also has tooling built in. And I've spoken to the team a few times as well. And I think they might even launch some other more like DeFi style mechanics, whether that's borrowing and lending, leverage, something like that. So Got it. And, and I think uh, so, so like it's specifically for market makers to go and market make in this, uh, in this marketplace. Like is, you, you mentioned the club. So I'm, I'm just asking because we don't know yet. Would love to get some so they have an order book but it's a little bit less of um um like pro order book style market making um exchange i would say meaning they don't have contracted market makers at least from what i know and i'm not sure exactly like what i can give away and so yeah got it okay you know, our producer. Yeah. Wow. Just, that was did very. That. Did you see that? Did, did you, you see, see that, Matt? Matt? I think he was looking. No. Up, so, so he didn't see it. I, I was <laughs> like, yeah. Unbelievable. The producer just did some stealthy shit. Wow. <laughs> did he bring the picture up in yeah, the like was, yeah. Yeah, for two <laughs> seconds and then right? I didn't even see it? Uh -huh. Damn, dude. That was, that that was well cold. Done. That was cold. <laughs> that was, you know, funny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. That is cool. That was something that I've seen recently and I've seen a lot of, you know, hype around it, so I figured I should ask. But the more uh, interesting one to us as of late is that I think Swiss France have arrived, right? On average, yep. can, you, can you give us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so VNX brought both their uh, Euro stablecoin, but also Swiss franc, and that kind of aligns with our initiative of supporting more non-dollar and non-Euro denominated stablecoins here in Avalanche. And so I think people uh, we'll continually see that push in the next three to six months, um, especially um, a focus on bringing kind of further liquidity as well as use cases to Avalanche, whether that's cross-border payments, remittances, uh, local currency hedging, that sort of thing. And so I think we'll see hopefully a proliferation of both stable coins, but also use cases for those stable coins in the not so distant future. 
kind of cool, man. Like we launched EuroC a while back now. And at one point, uh, I, I honestly don't, you know, didn't look at the, you know, Coinbase volumes anymore. But at one point we had the most volume versus like yep. centralized exchanges and whatnot. And it was one of those things. I think Avalanche is truly becoming the Fed chain with all the FX assets on there. You know, can't say I'm, I'm you know, I'm not going to complain. I think it's a very nice thing. Just for our audience, uh, FX is an extremely liquid market. Mm -hmm. And FX is a, if you have access, very easy to hedge market, right? Now, FX under the covers settles uh, in multiple days, depending on which currency pair. If you're trading dollars against Canada, it's going to be one day. If you're trading most of the pairs, it's going to be two days, right? Uh, and this settlement has to be two days in traditional finance because nothing is instantaneous under the covers. Like, I honestly think FX is one of those use cases where existing traditional finance market makers actually moving their stuff to something like Avalanche, they're going to have massive back office simplification, massive cost savings, like massive improvements overall. Because imagine how big the back office processes, teams, and costs of a large bank is. And, you know, it's needed because the assets are not really capable of instantly settling. They can't be transferred point, from point A to point B quickly. And that's what effects on chain solves. You know, I know a lot of people talk about real world assets. Uh, my view is like FX is the best real world asset, as it's called. And it, the people that will benefit the most will be like traditional finance. You give it to them and they're going to make themselves a lot more efficient and all the liquidity is going to come on chain. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of our own thesis regarding OnFi, RWAs, et cetera. It's actually more so the back office efficiencies rather than, oh, these rural assets are going to give us so much TVL, et cetera. It's like, no, these are good use cases. Like traditional finance is going to want to use them because they'll be saving money versus we're not just yes. trying to inflate our costs. metrics or something. Yeah, exactly. It's all about costs. Like, you know, again, just to put perspective, right? Like an existing institution if they go from technology A to technology B, depending on their size, if it's if they're a $1 billion or $5 billion and up market cap company, going from technology A to technology B costs them three years, maybe more. Like in the case of a bank, which handles money, five years, sometimes 10 years. I'm not kidding. I, these are real stuff. And for them to be able to justify those timelines, the money savings need to be significant. And when people talk about institutions coming on chain, all you're going to give them is here is how much money you would save if you did this under the covers. And all of these guys have been saying blockchain as a technology for many years. So I think we're very close to that inflection point where, you know, I mean, look at Avalanche and how we're doing, right? You have Euro C, you have Swiss franc. I guarantee you other pairs are coming. Circle is going to issue more. I think the future is quite bright in this regard, honestly. What other real world assets uh, are interesting to you specifically? You know, you can talk about Apple Labs or you can talk about a personal as well. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I think as an industry, we've seen as like risk-free rates within traditional finance continually as they've gone up, uh, tokenized treasuries have gotten a lot more interest on chain, especially unfortunately because of the price of kind of your higher risk assets have gone down. And therefore, a lot of these protocols that derive yield from these higher risk assets, <laughs> the protocol yield has gone down. And so we've seen this kind of um, inverse relationship where obviously if your risk-free rates and uh, TradFi are going up and within crypto, they're going down or within blockchain, they're going down, more people are gonna move money to traditional finance. And so um, bringing those tokenized treasuries on chain and kind of giving access to risk-free rates on chain that might th like through looping strategies might be higher than current yields within various protocols. I think it makes a, a ton of sense and is just low hanging Ooh. fruit, especially if there's like yield funds or someone that needs to just store like short-term liquid liquidity. Uh, That's what I was going to ask. Who is the audience liquidity? here? Like, it, you know, the yeah. crypto degens probably don't touch this as much, I imagine, because there's always another mm -hmm. shit going to play with. But like, who, who do you envision the audience for tokenized uh, treasuries, for example? 
Yeah, so to be completely honest, I think via our own surveys, there's a variety of kind of users of these protocols, whether it's um, protocols themselves storing their treasury on chain, if they don't have access to uh, more traditional venues that might be regulated, whether it's a token, sorry, uh, a yield fund or a uh, liquid token fund that might have short term capital that um, they don't know what to do with. And so they don't want to totally take it off chain, maybe take a few bips hit because a few bips on a few million obviously is a lot of money. And so they would rather just um, buy some short duration tokenized treasuries or put it into like a tokenized money markets account, something like that. And so I think personally, that's what we've seen are the main users of um, these tokenized treasuries. I think the tricky part is because they're technically securities, you don't have quite the audience you do for something like stable coins in which right. people within emerging markets countries want access to dollars just because a local currency might be depreciating versus because these are not permissionly traded, permissionlessly traded like those stable coins. Unfortunately, they can't get as easy access to these tokenized treasuries as something like a stable coin. And so I think um, there is a, a quite a large audience, but um, it is a little bit limited in nature, just depending on what you want to achieve. Um, I think obviously as blockchain grows and maybe we, we hit strides on to kind of the beginnings of a new bull market, tokenized treasuries might be one of the fastest growing assets in all of blockchain. I mean, they have been the past year in terms of like percentage change. And so that's kind of my own personal thesis. I mean, you always have the RWAs and OCAs of like, tokenized real estate, um, stable coins. I know Morgan from our side or head of institutional loves to say, oh, they're technically backed by collateral off chain. And so they're RWAs if you really think about it. And so she likes That's bringing correct. up stable coins. 100%. And, yeah. yeah. So she likes bringing up stable coins as well. Um, I think so you might to, also just go on to like devil's, devil's advocate for the uh, tokenized treasuries. Like I, I just haven't been able to wrap my head around like, UX has to be at least equivalent and, you know, permissions, KYC, AML probably is the same, right? When you buy treasuries from, if you're a US citizen, you go to the webpage, to, you know, I forget the webpage exactly, but there exists one where they just let you buy them direct, right? Or I think you, it's called literally treasury direct. Treasury <laughs> like direct called, or yeah. something. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, you know, if you don't know how to use that webpage, you can get it through your broker or... If you're outside of the country, if you're thinking U.S. Treasuries, you probably will have access to it through your whatever financial system. When it is tokenized, if it is not, if that yield is not easily accessible, like you know, you're adding a smart contract and a sort of custodian risk on top, right? There's a company in the middle, mm -hmm. and I think you know, like the U.S has to beat the existing one or somehow the yields have to beat the existing access solutions. I think for the emerging market, like if you're a small business or a mid cap business in the emerging markets and your currency and your government bonds fluctuate a lot, then this is a great product. But again, I think, uh, you know, in the near term, the regulator unclarity sort of makes it difficult. And given that, I think they've grown tremendously. You're right. Like, you know, if it was easier, and if this wasn't deemed a security, or if it was freely accessible to everybody, imagine what kind of growth would have been, you know, since 2022 on this specific asset. So I, I really think, you know, regulation and the regulatory sort of clarity is one of those big things that are blocking the RWA uptake, quite honestly. So I just wanted to say that. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. So prior to, um, the previous end of the club I was on, we hadn't announced our multiverse agreement yet, yes. as well as simple swap. There's been a lot going on, honestly. Yes, so we want to talk about that as well. Yeah. 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 How's everything going on that front in terms Things of like are... updates? I mean, you guys had 25 million transactions. Was that the, was the number? And 24. Uh, we're, we're on the road to 20. I think 24. we're 24 yeah. and some okay. change right now. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so. in, in a couple of days, yeah. uh, we'll get there. So simple swap has been going well for those uh harder working community members i'm gonna say i'm not gonna call out anybody by name uh they have been tracking public repos of potential partners that are going to be integrating with us uh we have 
actually been working very closely with one of the big names that you know, uh, you know eventually is going to turn this on. And you know, like if you remember, the journey of Dexalot has been sort of a multi-step thing, you know, in line with multiverse. First step was the club. Second step was the subnet. Third step was incentivization and curating the liquidity, i.e. the supply side. Next step is curating the demand side by giving people the most possible distribution to our price. Now, uh, you haven't been on the show where we talked about this, but if you look at simple swap pricing, and I'm going to ask you your sort of feedback on this. If you look at simple swap pricing versus alternative means of trading today, depending on the time of the day, depending on which asset you're trading, you're going to get anywhere from 5x to 40x spread savings, particularly if your size isn't, you know, less than 100 bucks, if mm -hmm. your size is somewhere between, you know, 1000 to $5,000 $5, range. So like, you know, we are at the cusp of proving that central limit order book solution is actually the best solution on uh, blockchain. But I wanted to get your opinion on how, how you think about simple swap as well. Yeah, um, to be completely frank, I've turned into quite the user of simple swap. Um, I would probably consider myself somewhat of a savvy DeFi user. And because you guys are not quite um, integrated within the DEX aggregators, I've been going to the simple swap front end and just comparing prices against the aggregators, against other uh, portals in terms of not portals but like front ends whether that's trader joe i don't know if you guys saw that emoji yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah. if you go yes, like this it'll do that. something really cool do you have have you tried that one Try i think this it's, one. A, it's a mac mac that does that yeah. Yeah. whoa <laughs> yeah the new, the new <laughs> yeah i think it was what is it sonoma is like the newest um yeah something like that. upgrade to the app yeah and so yeah it's funny it always happens during calls but back to simple swap <laughs> <For sure. laughs> um yeah but I become quite the user and like you mentioned, especially for smaller sizes, a hundred to $5,000 swaps, which is probably like 90 to 95% of swaps. If you're swapping more than that, generally, if you have to swap it in one transaction, it's because of like a flash loan liquidations happening, something like that. I think most people would rather, obviously, if they're going <laughs> to try and buy in size swap like, TWAP over time anyway. And so they should split up their buys into multiple smaller sizes in which it'll facilitate that a hundred to $5,000 swap. And, and, anyway. and the so. data definitely supports that. Like if you, you know, uh, actually all, I think I'm going to say all of the aggregators have very nice analytics portals. If you go mm -hmm. to their analytics portals and look at their data, like, uh, you'll see 99% of all the trades that come through are $2,000 or less. Uh, so we, we, you know, worked with obviously the market makers that we have either contracted or non-contracted. So the liquidity has been focusing on that batch so that we capture most of the users. But I've also heard from other people, like I've even heard a case where somebody said, I wanted to swap hundred K and, you know, hopefully we'll get there. I, I can't say we have hundred K, uh, yet, but as the solution is proven, as the distribution is turned on and as the volume and the market share is captured. You know, we're gonna make that happen. So we're come on now. Got gotta be able to facilitate the big boy buys with the fake ETF news now. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh. Yes. So let me let me ask you this question, bro. Like this is a the, we're gonna require a hot take here. So you have an ETF, which is a traditional financial asset. And on the other other side, you have the laser eyes who are like, no chaos, whatever, right? Yeah. Are laser eyes going to be happy with ETF news or are they not going to be happy with ETF news? What's the, what's the take here? It's like, you know, I could argue either way. So I would love to hear it from you. Yeah. So this is really interesting because I have this moral, not, it's not a, like my own personal moral dilemma, but it's definitely like the, it's not cynical take, but it's like uh, your stereotypical crypto bro or person is anti-establishment. They're like, Bitcoin is the ultimate hedge against civilization if the world goes to shit bitcoin will still exist cyberpunk etc sure. but they don't really understand in terms of liquidity and getting to large getting to bitcoin to a very large market cap it's going to take 
the facilitation of traditional finance and getting Bitcoin basically to the masses. And so I think for their own financial gain, they want the ETF, but for their cyberpunk mentality, it's like, oh, like, no, like we do not want BlackRock and Citadel and et cetera in our business. But personally, I, I think they're not going to care if Bitcoin ever does hit 100K plus or something like that. I honestly think a lot of the laser eye guys will be no longer laser eyes once Bitcoin hits a big price because they'll no longer be back. This, this is just what I think. And I almost want to say yeah. the rhetoric is like a part of the journey, if you will. And, and like to your point, uh, I mean, let's put it into perspective with examples, right? The previous job that I held and the team that I was part of would trade anywhere from 70 to 120 billion billion with a B dollars a day, meaning that's one company, one team within that company that's doing that volume. Yes, it's one of the larger teams with respect to that industry effects, but imagine all the other companies and all the other teams that are doing volumes in the same vicinity in one market. And look at crypto volumes today. You know, half of it is probably fake because most of it is not on chain. The volumes are so small. It's like a leaf mm -hmm. in the wind, right? And the reason why traditional finance has grown to what it has grown is because liquidity and these institutions being there with balance sheets to dampen the volatility and continuously provide buy or sell or other services to the end users. And I almost want to say, yes, the origin of crypto has been anti-establishment and whatnot, but user adoption requires you to come away from that completely anti-establishment and come away from the completely traditional finance to some middle ground. And that's what we've, we've been, um, I, at least I shouldn't say we, I've been arguing with respect to what we're doing with Dexalot, right? Dexalot is a limit order book style exchange, which is exactly what traditional finance players understand with the added benefits of being completely on chain on an amazing technology stack, such as Avalanche on, on its own subnet. You know, so I think you guys are spot on. And, you know, I think Avalabs is probably the only company that's truly pursuing this institutional adoption, this liquidity coming on chain type strategy. Right. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? It, it, I don't know about the only one that's I, I don't like to speak in superlatives generally. But, yes, that is a major focus of ours, I will say. And I think we want to basically embrace every individual user institution enterprise that wants to use blockchain technology and essentially facilitate them having a home within our ecosystem whether it is your on-chain dgen your nft trader gamer that doesn't even care about blockchain but likes fun games and likes owning their own in-game assets whether it's jp morgan chase whether it's walmart building their own subnet which these are all theoretical names but Yes, I think our goal is to essentially facilitate everyone that we can. Um, well, I'm in terms of like what you said is well, re reportedly, okay? Yeah, <laughs> reportedly, look, Walmart, reportedly, JP Morgan Chase, all that stuff. As right? long as I can pay for my cybernetic implants in our post apocalyptic future, I'm good, man. You know what yes. I'm saying? So, uh -huh. but yeah, but back to um, the spot based ETF. I think it is really interesting because like 99% of the time, Spot-based ETFs are better for most individuals to invest into and track the price um, more closely than futures-based ETFs. But unfortunately, our, our current SEC chairman had other plans, and now we have Ethereum futures ETFs, Bitcoin futures ETFs, etc. I've seen. Um, so I've I, seen, yeah, I've seen some comments about why is the futures one allowed and why the spot one is not. The reason is futures go through CME guys. Yep. CME is a regulated entity. It is the top, you know, uh, exchange in the world, heavily, heavily, heavily regulated across multiple global uh, regulators. And that's why that was approved. Futures is technically not Bitcoin, right? And the prices diverge, as you said. Obviously, under the covers, there are market makers who are going to price it accordingly, but not everybody can market make on CME either, right? There is a lot of gatekeeping that happens behind the scenes. And that's the reason why the futures one is more easy or more palatable i think again i i'm you know i'm not inside i'm just speculating mm -hmm.
but that's probably why that's occurring. Yeah, you're exactly correct. And for those who don't know, a combination of Contego, backwardation, and just uh, like rolling futures into like the next month generally is what causes an asset not to mirror uh, the spot price of that asset for a future CTF. Do, do, do you remember um, when a barrel of oil was negative $40? <laughs> yeah, because, <laughs> yep, it, the, the, it, was, it was hilarious. I was reading stories about like, People that lived in like pent not penthouses, but apartments in New York City, essentially owning to take <laughs> these futures. Yes, exactly. Settling like and physical. One of yep. the, so I mean, I lived that as a part of my sort of market making business. I, you know, I, I never looked at commodities, but commodities was under the same tech stack with us. And uh, you know, the funny thing is, a lot of people did not realize that oil could go below zero. Okay, that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, one of the bigger trades that hedge funds used to do, not this time around, but prior time around, was rent very large oil carriers. I forget the exact acronym. Mm -hmm. Do the trade as long as that you know uh, negative price situation persisted. Take as much as possible. Put the oil into the tankers. Hold. And then once the market recovers, when OPEC does whatever, when the powers that be fix the situation, mm -hmm. massively profit. And this time around, when it hit negative 40, there were no tankers available for people to hire. Yeah, because the supply chain issues with COVID. Because it was already yep. armed and supply chain issues and blah, 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 blah. So we were we were like at the desk looking at the prices and we were like, wow, it's, it's <laughs> one of those wild stories, man. For sure. Yeah, I mean, that's why digital assets generally should well spot etf should it like exactly mirror what that physical asset is because there isn't here like storage costs similar to physical commodities so right no exchange for physical you don't take delivery right you're you already have <laughs> i mean you money. could but physical it doesn't cost really that much to store exactly. unless you're going through a custodian which it still even shouldn't the cost that much it's a yeah, even asset. the custodians don't cost anything like storing oil right oil is toxic exactly. technically storing that requires a lot of stuff so uh tell us a little bit about ava cloud like it is one of those things that was announced obviously a while back but, you know, given the focus on embracing all the institutions, I think this is one of your key sort of Lego blocks for institutions to pick up. Do you mind just giving us a little bit of a shill just so people in, you know, listening understand what it is? Yeah. So the quick TLDR is it's blockchain as a managed service. And so unless you're in the industry, industry you don't really understand the intricacies of what it takes to maintain your own blockchain. I mean, you guys maintaining your own subnet, you guys probably went through it the hard way in terms of you need um, validators. We are pre hyper Let me put it that way. Yeah, we're pre hyper exactly. pre can, can you leak any? Yeah. Can you leak any alpha about potential Dexalot upgrades into using the, the Hyper-SDK in the future? Do it, Firestorm. Uh, uh -huh. I am not the right guy for leaking that. I could, but I'd rather have the founders be here and then leak the stuff just because, you know, like they're, they're the people that's actually going to be pushing that through. But I mean, like, let, let's put it this way, right? The existing subnet implementation was pre a lot of these amazing products being shipped. I mean, if you look at like uh, Firewood was the last big one that, that got shipped also, yep. I think, right? Every single one yep. of these things can be used, right? And, you know, we ended up like pushing the subnet out before these. And we were like, you know, watching Pog, you know, put out like a sample exchange <laughs> shortly after we'll, we'll launch our subnet in like a day or something. I forget, 48 hours or something crazy like that. So I think the short answer is, you know, given where the exchange is at, the existing subnet is holding pretty well. It's a, you know, uh, EVM-like uh, solution. And we're not anywhere near capacity yet, but we do know where our capacity thresholds are. And you can bet your ass that we have contingencies planned as to when we turn on the demand side, we get the volume and we get the actual listings, uh, you know, how we're going to evolve the product further to even better compete with TradFi solutions. And again, what I mean by that is in TradFi, you know, the orders that you submit, 
arrive and get confirmed whether it's a trade or whether it's posting you know in a matter of a few hundred milliseconds depending on which market you're looking at it will change but you know the goal here is to make our solution be comparable and more competitive if possible than you know the closed end uh, systems so yeah it's gonna happen that's the as, as much alpha as i can well i think the next time we do our uh monthly wrap up we should uh, have have Nihat come on and, and drop some alpha. I think that'd be great because he's me. in here in the chat right now. Shout out to yes, that's right. He he, he yeah. smelled the oil discussion. Yes, from yeah. is, <laughs> is, he, is he an oil trader or he, something? He, he's, he's, he's an ex oil tycoon. Let's say. I gotcha. His Make, background, makes sense. you know, is in the oil and gas field. I believe uh, it was. You know, he used to run technology stuff in there. Uh, okay. For many years. I gotcha. Yeah, 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 but back, back to the we can get from you. Sorry, <laughs> back to the Ava Cloud and Ava Studios discussion. Um, the way I like to describe Avalanche as a network is essentially it's a blank canvas network that allows people to create whatever they might need for their use case, and we provide low-level technology to facilitate um, those use cases, whether it's AWM and interoperability, firewood highly performant database, hyper SDK, totally, well, totally VM agnostic subnets, et cetera. And so I think that can be a little bit um, overbearing and too much to think about to some people, especially enterprises that might not know a ton about the industry. And so Ava Cloud is what they can essentially leverage. And so they don't have to think about any of those blockchain complexities. They can have one a thing, one-click deployment of a subnet within 30 seconds, something like that. One very interesting conversation that I have been part of, right? People think about complexity of implementation, but they often, from outside looking in, they often forget about liability of building it incorrectly internally. Like most of these companies when they're building something, especially the big ones who are heavily regulated, will have to think about where the liability is and if they build it, what the liability profile looks like. And if an expert builds it, what the liability profile looks like. And more often than not, even if it is cheaper to build something internally, they will choose the expert service provider to build it for them because the expert service provider provides SLAs as well as clauses in the agreements for the service, which protect the company purchasing the service, right? And I know this doesn't sound sexy or fun or anything like that, but it is probably a higher importance consideration for a big company to outsource this development. Because imagine, yeah, you're, you're going to pay more potentially, but the service is going to be perfect and it's going to be built by the guys who actually built the underlying infrastructure. And I think this is a big edge that, again, everybody talks about just the underlying tech and ability to finalize, et cetera, but this service can actually really supercharge this industry and it will fit the needs of the institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you look into things like Hyperledger Fabric and some of the enterprises that have used Hyperledger Fabric and how much it costs them to build a blockchain team and essentially eventually launch their own blockchain. It's years of development, millions yeah. of dollars, et cetera. Right, it's like it's CRM, right? Like you know, most CRM tools are no longer in-house built. Some companies still have them, but, you know, most of them are built by a company dedicated to doing CRM. So in that sense, I think it makes perfect sense. Uh, and I think, you know, this is one of the strongest uh, prospects for our ecosystem, honestly. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a different question. When is trading being turned on in Stars Arena, bro? Where is the alpha? Can we get the real alpha? Uh, we've been, we've been talking about stuff for the last you know half an hour, but you haven't said anything about Stars Arena. What's going on? Speaking of ecosystem, so I'll get, I'll give the short Stars Arena story um, from my point of view because I did a decent, but not a decent bit of travel, but a week of travel when it really blew up. Um, so SmartCon was the very beginning of this month. Uh, tail end of September, beginning of October. And that's when Stars Arena just was going absolutely crazy. And so Nadim and myself, we met with the Stars Arena team and it was kind of a solo builder the first week of September. And so they were in the ecosystem for a bit, a solid three to four weeks actually, in which 
they had under a thousand followers on Twitter, not a lot of users on the platform, um, really no super large like Twitter accounts yet, et cetera. And then while Nadim and I were at SparkCon, one thing led to another and it, it seemed like the whole world sort of using Stars Arena in a matter Dude, of what like was, 10 days. What, was, what were those one thing that led to others? Like, I think that's an important thing for projects to hear. If you can just give a little bit more color because that's what almost all projects that are building want to achieve, right? Like what were their, you know, things that they did right? Yeah, so I actually think it was a combination effort between their own team and they have a pretty good social media team that was posting on Twitter that was making funny memes. And then uh, a few pretty large crypto Twitter accounts started joining the arena. And then even your non-crypto accounts started joining the arena. And that's primarily, I think, because of the account abstraction, being able to sign on via Twitter. And it takes five seconds. You don't have to deal with your own keys, yeah. none of your stereotypical blockchain components. And you basically can hop right into the arena uh, in a matter of a minute. You didn't even have to, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, enter like any personal information because nope. essentially they just use your Twitter authorized. account. Personal. Just authorize yep. the app and you're good. Yep. Authorize Twitter and you're done. Exactly. And so I think for me, that was the biggest like zero to one moment that most teams should focus upon is you want to lower the barrier of entry as much as possible within this industry. And to get the masses, you basically just take away every element of blockchain that you've put in their face and give them the easiest um, on-ramp way to use the platform, et cetera. So. I think this is particularly true for games, right? Like the gamers yep. is extremely sort of closed when it comes to like blockchain and crypto stuff. So they don't really care about that most of the time. And they prefer a UX where you just install the game or you just load the game and play the game without necessarily needing to know the blockchain or the crypto stuff until you want to, right? So in that sense, mm -hmm. I think it's a very nice example for people to follow. UX matters maybe even more than the product in this case, because this product did exist on other blockchains as well, or like not exactly in this form, but some similar product, the social Fi, didn't exactly start here in the beginning, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. I thought it was a very cool example for a lot of projects and builders to you know, learn something from. Definitely. The unfortunate situation um, at this point in time is that 99.999% of users do not care about decentralization, governance, voting, etc. They just went the fastest, the cheapest with 100% uptime. Um, you do those three things and you're going to be able to get users, I mean, especially it all, if you it all have comes an easy down. onboarding experience. Yeah, I mean, it all comes down to that spectrum, right? You have the super anti-establishment all about decentralization. <laughs> then you have the guys who want an amazing product, may or may not care about decentralization or whatever, right. And but they don't put it in the forefront of their decision-making process. Like they don't you know, think about that first. They think about the product first, and maybe then they'll think about decentralization. I think it's a very nice and tangible example that's been achieved by the Stars Arena team in that regard. Yeah, and I mean, it's a tale as old of time as to like, it even goes back to people trusting centralized exchanges. People are like, oh, why are people still getting burnt? This has been happening since yeah. 2014. Right. You ask. People don't, yeah, exactly. People don't like to deal with a, a ledger, with a treasure right. and dealing with their own private keys right. and the risk of losing those private keys or the smart wallet, or sorry, the, um hard wallet themselves that sort of thing so they just i think, don't want to be their own banks is what it comes I, to I, exactly I honestly, yeah. I honestly think if there was a required sort of three sentence text that says if you go the centralized exchange route this is the statistical percentage of you losing your assets because of a b c d risks if you go decentralized here's the statistical percentage like if there was some uh, educational material that is required for people to see or understand first uh, that could make a difference because a lot of guys who hear Bitcoin on CNBC because it's being talked about so much they'll go and buy it but they have no idea what it is what's under the covers and they don't even know who they're trusting their money or you know uh, 
Capital One Bitcoin. Money. Anyways, we're just counting down till Stars Arena adds video, man. That's going to be. Right. Whew, let's go. Yeah. How, I mean, how, how far are we from that, Matt? Can you? Are you? Uh, are you in those discussions I, at all? I hope it's coming sooner than later, both video and audio, because yeah. then you can replace Twitter Spaces, you can yes. replace Twitch. Yes. A lot of stuff you can do then. So. Well, not, we don't want to replace Twitch. We like it here on Twitch. We like Twitch. Well, no, sorry. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just, <laughs> have, have, uh, have streams on both at the same yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what we're saying. I mean, I, I, you, you know me. You know the decks a lot, guys. We, we work with a lot of video, so I've just been like... Uh, counting down till the till the stars arena will let me upload some videos and uh but we are back on there guys we'll be posting exclusive content to our stars arena account so make sure you're following dex a lot and make sure you're following our boy matt man he's on there i'm on there too but i'm just like i've i mainly focus on the uh the dex a lot stuff these days man i'm not much of a poster anymore uh um, yeah to be really completely was, but what's that to be completely frank my uh stars arena account is very weak i will not lie to you guys like so Nadim, I'm pretty sure, was like <laughs> probably one of the first 10 accounts on there because of our very early meeting. And I got my account right before it blew up, like middle of September. But um, I definitely was not spending as much time in the arena as what some Avalabs employees were. I, I was traveling and still trying to maintain my like <laughs> being a, a good employee, working quite a bit and not yeah. spending all of my time on social media. So. I know how it goes. I think I'm on the same boat, but hopefully you have a Dexalot share at least, you know, as one of our top supporters. You know, I, I'm gonna expect to see you on the holder lists. You know, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> I mean, guilt tripping me into buying all the shares these days. Right. <laughs> that's right. That's how it's done, man. You gotta beg when when appropriate. Well, oh, Ackerman is asking, and this is an AMA. I guess we should have said that. You can ask questions. Uh, I think Coop, 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 that Garrison, actually makes a ton of sense. Yeah, Luigi. I mean, um, Kevin, I think Coop and Garrison were probably the top two, other than Avery. Now that I'm thinking about it, there's like a group of like five people that probably, when it really started popping off, spent like a hundred plus hours in the arena in a single week, something wow, crazy. Real gladiators, man. That's, That's wild. Say. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Some real guy. <laughs> when the arena calls, you got to answer the call, man. You know, yeah, you got to right. accept the challenge when appropriate. The arena challenge. Well, right. this has been another like awesome interview, dude. We always love having you on the show. I just got to say, like, you know, thanks from the Dexlot team, man, because we see you out here always like showing us love and like, you know, I'll be in a, I'll be in an Avalabs Twitter space and like Matt will just pipe up and be like Dexlot though. You know what I mean? And so I really, I really got to uh, give you a shout out for that, man. We appreciate all the love and all the support. And um, it's just, it's, it's really cool to uh, have people in the community shouting us out like that, just uh, make, making it known. So we appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, anytime. I mean, keep building good uh, order books that are efficient, maintaining good levels of liquidity. I'll keep sh shouting you guys out. That's a great, that's a great Hell, shout yeah. out. I love that. I love that. Uh -huh. um, super funny too, because your simple swap answer, like really could have gone either way. You're like, listen, I'll be frank. I thought, I thought I'm, I'm using simple swap right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was going to go. Like, Jeez, this could go either way. I don't know. So, uh, but yeah, great. actually I'm, I'm not, not paying attention to the show. Just over here doing a bunch of swaps on this. <laughs> Listen, that's what we want. It's okay. I'll be frank. Me too. You know, and I'm hoping. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, last time you we were on the show, man. Uh, Some Biggie. Uh, we didn't, yeah. we didn't, I know we, we, we requested Biggie, but here's the thing. We got to talk about, we got to have you back because you and I didn't get to talk about uh, 90s NBA or, uh, or, or any hip hop. So, but I do need to get a song request from you before you go. And I, I said at the top of the show, I'm like, I'm playing a bunch of house music early because I'm going to get really mm -hmm. raptastic for my guy, Matt, when uh, at, the, at the tail end of the show here. So what are we thinking today? So I actually went through my Spotify right before this because I was like, you know what? I have to have some good song off the top of my head. And do you have Ignorance is Bliss by Kendrick Lamar? I'm it's sure an I old do. Kendrick. I'm okay. sure I do. So we'll do some, um, some Ignorance is Bliss. Ignorance is Bliss by Kendrick. All right, let me make sure I got it. I'm. I, it's got to be in here somewhere. I have like countless Kendrick songs, but let me make sure. Yeah. And uh, it's a it's a Kendrick song that people might not know about, but yeah, it's is, a it, good is one. it like cartoons and serial era? Yeah, it is okay. that era. Okay, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking yep. about. Uh, Producer John, d- get that one for me just in case I don't have it on my laptop because this is my newer laptop that doesn't have my entire rap library. My entire rap library is so big that um, <laughs> I, I, I have it on a hard drive. Matt, is there a message in this request Jonathan asks? What is the message? No, uh, yeah, no message. It was just, it's a good song. It's, I, I personally... I don't know what it is, but like when I was younger, like middle school, early high school days, it just seemed like hip hop was just better. All these artists felt like they're in their prime, whether it's Drake, J. Cole, Kendrick, et cetera. And so some of their old music, it just gets me nostalgic and I prefer it. So you're absolutely right. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. And this is what you guys, maybe you don't, maybe you know this about me. Maybe you don't for our, for our chat. Um, I was on a rap radio station here in Minneapolis, like the big rap radio station. I used to be, hey, it's your boy Jimmy two times. I got tickets coming up for sound set. We're going to be giving away tickets in the next 15 minutes. So make sure you call me 651-989-9595. And uh, coming up, we got new music from Kendrick Lamar. But first, let's hear from Meg Thee Stallion. This one is called whatever. You know what I'm saying? I just did a radio break for you guys live in the air. Mm -hmm. So rap has gotten so bad, man. (laughs) Let me just tell you, like, it's getting so bad now. Um... Where to the point where like I was on the station and the industry stuff, the stuff they were sending us was so bad that like the format almost changed. And it eventually did because the station went out of business. But that's a story for another time. You're absolutely right, Matt. I like listening to the old stuff better. Every once in a while, something will come out and I'll be like, okay, like that new Lil Yachty and J. Cole and Cameron just Mm -hmm. dropped a freestyle on it, which is fire. Awesome. Old school cam sounds. But We'll save the rap discussions for another day, man. I'm going to do some Ignorance is Bliss for you coming up, some Kendrick. But Matt Schmank, BD at Avalabs, man, we just want to thank you for joining the show again. This this has been awesome, dude. Thank we always, you, these, always These are the conversations. I mean, you and Firestorm went off. I was just sitting here like a bump on a log. But it's one of those where we learned so much in these conversations. You know what I mean? And we're all caught up on Avalabs now. We're all caught up on Dex a lot. So I just got to say thanks again, man. These are awesome. And you got to come back. We got to come back for more uh, NBA and, and uh, rap talk. Yeah, maybe we do a, a holiday special and talk about all stuff going on in terms of NBA, hip hop, that sort of thing. So. <laughs> for sure, man, for sure. We'll just do a space on that one day, like crypto That's guys who like rap. Enter, enter the chat. <laughs> crypto you know talks I mean? rap. For sure. Uh, all right, Matt Schmank. Thanks again, my friend. We will see you man. soon. Yeah, have a good one. See you. You too, man. You too.